autism spectrum. Um, and we're just getting through and learning and I'm excited to share with you guys what I've learned. And Kristen? My name is Kristen King and I have three children. My youngest is three and he's on the spectrum. Um, I can't click here. Do you want to oh, right. start? Yeah. So <laughs> here's our summertime. We're going to go over um, safety, going places, free time. Um, we'll do questions. And if you have questions throughout, feel free to pop them in the chat um, and somebody will let us know, um, whichever one of us isn't talking. And then our references for you. Um, do you want to click to the third slide? Mine's showing the water playing children. What is it showing on? All I'm seeing is the first slide. Um, and it's not showing in present. It's kind of showing in edit. Okay. Sorry, that's where my confusion is. No, let me see if I can fix it again. It's giving us some troubles this morning. Did it change that time? Not on my screen, no. No, it's back to a black screen. It was up and running, Cat, on yours. Uh -huh. But I think that it might have been in the a different mode. So, and now it's back up. Okay. Kristen, you can't see that? I can see that. I can see the screen. Um, but it's on the first slide. And it's not in present. Yeah, so when I went to present, that's when it disappeared from Kathy. Right. Kathy, you're seeing it change slides? Yep, I am. Let me, maybe I need to get out of the actual PowerPoint, maybe because I'm in it. Yeah, you should get out maybe. of it. And you should be watching it on your screen with Kat. You know, maybe Kat it's messing it up. That's the only thing I can think of. Okay, I can see it now. Okay. okay. It must have been then, because it was in the background. That's strange. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll just leave it like this and you can see my tab, <laughs> but that way it doesn't disappear. All right. All right. Are we on track now? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, so we're just going to start with a couple of statistics about water and um, autism. So this one that we found was that a 2015 study found that children with autism spectrum disorder enjoy swimming significantly more than children without autism. Um, and water, water can be really a wonderful thing for uh, children on the spectrum. It's, it's good for calming, it's good for sensory, um, on the other hand, it can also be a huge risk, especially for children who wander. Um, and this slide, while adolescents on the spectrum can be drawn to water for its soothing properties, it can also be a major source of danger. Um, a study from the National Autism Association found accidental drownings as the cause of 91% of deaths reported in children with autism who are younger than 15 and involved in a wandering accident. So that kind of goes back to the wandering. And I think the only way we can really prevent that is to be aware of our surroundings, especially when um, we're in areas that we don't know. You can go to the next slide. So how do we keep our kids safe? Start safe water rules early. Be aware of bodies of water, lakes, rivers, pools. Um, if you're visiting with relatives or family, ask them. We're, we're in such a wooded state. There's so many bodies of water that we don't even see in the woods. Ask around um, to see what's out there. Consider swim lessons. We reached out to the Y in Augusta. They have an adaptive swim on Fridays. They said that not a lot of people take their children to it. I think they only have two kids that are that go um, on a regular basis. So, you know, check 
check whatever area you're in to see what what your your YMCA or your your swim facilities have. Um, watch your child even if they can't swim. Alert neighbors with pools that your child is drawn to the water and make a visual pool safety chart. And I think the next slide has one of those. So these are just kind of swim visuals. I've never used one of these, um, but I think it would be really good, especially for children that are more into the visual that are nonverbal. This could be a really good tool, um, you know, and just keep it as simple as possible. You know your kiddo, you know what they can handle when it comes to stuff like this. Um, And so following up on with the wandering in the water, we go to wandering elopement in general. Um, what is elopement? It was a new term for me a couple of years ago, and it pretty much just means somebody leaving the safe area um, without somebody else knowing. So uh, one of my kiddos likes to wander. He likes to follow a bird that flies through the woods, um, a butterfly that goes into the driveway, um, just can't see anything else but that thing he's watching. Um, and then I have another one who bolts, especially when she's hurt, she'll just take off and bolting. I mean, it's very much what it sounds like. They just take off. And that could be because they're trying to get away from something that they don't like, whether it's a phobia or a sensory overload, or that they're so driven to what they do want to get to. Um, and a lot of the times we use language like, what's your plan? Can you tell me your plan? Um, and now that she's to the point where she's understanding, I'm not saying no, I just need to know what the plan is and why we're going and where we're going. Um, another statistic is that according to the National Autism Association, 49% of people have eloped or wandered off. Um, so, and those are, I mean, those can be very scary things to hear. So what can we do to help? Um, alarms for your doors. It can be as high tech or low tech as you want. You can get, um, so when I was in middle school, the book fair came out with this really cool thing. That was a book that came with a bedroom alarm. And all it was, was two pieces to put together. And when the door opened, it made a really loud noise. They still sell those little alarms that you can put on the door. Um, and it might deter them from opening it if they don't like the loud noise, but it, you will at least hear it. We don't have a lot of fences up here in Maine. So considering a fence might be something, uh, a medical ID bracelet. And again, talking to your neighbors. We live in a small, small town. Um, so my son and I, the one that wonders more than the other, we go to the fire station and we meet them. We go to the only gas station in town and we meet them. Just these big uh, high traffic areas. We make sure that people who know town know who he is should something happen. It makes me feel better about him getting back to me. Um, those social stories and visuals that you saw in SWIM can, um, those visuals can be used for any safety rule that you need. And you can be, have as many or as few, depending on your child, if they can really only see like the four main ones, we put the four main ones up. Um, and put them somewhere that they'll see them. They won't see them at your eye level. They'll see them at their eye level. Um, we've put big stop signs on the door with a picture of a grown up because you're supposed to stop and ask a grown up. Again, one of mine loves our trampoline. It's outside. He um, he said to my mom one time when she was watching him, I want to go outside and play. And she said, okay, let me finish this. And he heard, okay. And he went outside to play and Thankfully, he was fine. He went straight to the trampoline. He didn't go farther. My mom, however, will never, ever take her eyes off him for a split second again. And she was probably more scarred than anybody in the situation. But it's just that kind of thing that now he has that visual that says, stop, I don't have a grown up. Um, creating a safety plan. Again, with the woods, you know, we get, well, we live in woods. And I often worry about my kids wandering too far into them. And it's so easy to get turned around. So creating those safety plans, what would happen if you do get lost? What would happen if all of a sudden you don't know where you are? What can you do? Um, can you yell? Can you find these landmarks? How are we going to get through this? 
Um, and then if eloping is caused by a trigger, if it is a sensory overload, if it is something they don't want, um, sometimes creating that safe place to elope to helps. Um, you know, then they're not just going wherever they can get to. They have that designated spot. You can also alert your local police stations. Autism Society of Maine has a printout that you can complete and take to them. Again, where we live, we're covered half time by state and half time by county. So we reach out to both of them. The Maine Warden Service is another one that you can reach out to because they cover all of Maine. Um, any questions so far? Anything come up in the chat box? I can't see it when I'm on, when I have my window open. Nope, nothing right now. All right. So next we're looking at pedestrian safety. And I have heard from several different clinicians in several different areas that this is one of the hardest things they've had to try to teach kids. Um, it could just be because there's that lack of cause and effect and not thinking through what would happen. It could be that they're so focused on going towards something um, or just not aware of their surroundings. So practice, just practice, practice. And if your person is somebody who is one of those locked into rules people, you can use that as your advantage right here because the rules are that we stop. We look for cars. And then I add in that if a car's coming, we wait. Because with my more neurotypical child, that was implied. With my less neurotypical children, that was not implied. They were like, oh yeah, there's a car, but now we can cross. So we stop, we look for cars, we wait for the cars, and then we go. Um, and we have another statistic here, a couple more that says that traffic accidents are the second most common cause of death death for people with autism. And about 18% of individuals with autism have been in some form of traffic accident. Um, there are the, again, social stories, visuals. There's also harnesses and um, like locking wrist bracelets. I've used harnesses with both of my kids and they really like them. They like having that security. I know some, some people don't. So it's finding out what works for your family. Um, and knowing those triggers and that elopement that we talked about is if there's something that's going to set them off, that they're going to bolt. Uh, we were at their therapy clinic the other day and my son um, tripped and skinned his hands. And when he is hurt, he bolts. And we were in the parking lot and I knew this. So as soon as he slipped, I didn't go straight towards him. I knew that he was okay, but um, I went around him so that I could get in front of him in the road because I knew which direction he was going and things like that. You know, your people, you know, you know more about them than anybody else does. Um, you can also employ your therapists on this, uh, OTs, their HCT, all these therapies, take it to them and be like, we're struggling with this. Can you help us? And they probably already have visuals and ideas and um, ROT practices going on walks um, all the time. So then looking at theme parks, if that's your idea of a vacation, um, personally, it's not my thing, but again, different people, different families. Um, some of the things that you can do is that medical ID bracelet, a temporary tattoo, um, Sharpie, uh, writing names and phone numbers, using the harness we talked about, um, packing water and snacks, especially if you have somebody who only eats certain things or only drinks out of certain types of bottles, um, a sensory bag with the headphones, the fidgets, the specific things that they like, and places who say you can't bring in food and drink, you can't bring in bags, just talk to them. A lot of the time people are really accommodating if you explain why you need what you have. Um, taking breaks. That's kind of my theme for the entire summer is take breaks, <laughs> take it at your own pace um, and have a sa safety plan. We've always had, if we get separated, this is where we go. Um, and this is who we look for. I also, again, with a wanderer and my wanderer is also nonverbal. So when we go to places, I find a couple of people who are in charge and I say, this is my child. I am me. Should he get lost, he belongs to me and here's my information um, because he can't 
can't or won't necessarily tell them. Um, and do your homework. A lot of places have a lot of accommodations. If you just ask, we were at the um, museum in the aquarium in Boston, and they have a whole sensory bag that actually has a visual card on it to point to like the different exhibits and what they want to do and where they want to go. There's quiet places to go. Um, there's some places that are like autism certified. That means that they have those quiet places and they have those sensory friendly things. Um, and they can also help you up, help you out like setting up that in case of emergency escape plan, like we're not having this anymore. We need to leave quickly. What's the quickest way out? And they might let you go through a back gate that you don't have to go the whole way back through or something like that. So outside um, can be very difficult. It can also be really good if you have people who love to be outside and love to be in nature and are just calmer outside and they can be louder and they can have more energy, but it comes with its own, its own struggles too. So the sun and heat. Uh, the first thing I would say is try different sunblock, sprays, creams, scented, unscented, whatever is going to work. Uh, the best, most effective sunscreen is the one that they'll use. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the different SPFs and the different brands and everything. It's If they're not gonna use it, it's not gonna help. Um, you can also use um, like shades, hats, rash guards. My kids live in rash guards in the summer, whether we're swimming or not. And this can all help with sun protection and staying cool. Um, kids with autism might have trouble recognizing if they're too hot. Um, in the winter, we talk about how they don't always recognize if they're too cold. Same goes in the summer when they're too hot. They might not realize they're getting dehydrated, they're getting overheated, they're getting sunburnt. Um, or any of those things. So if you just keep an extra eye on that. You can also teach them to help apply the sunscreen. Uh, this is something that we learned with my son and hair washing because the, the sensation of hair washing was so hard on him um, sensory wise that we taught him to help us. So it's kind of like how you can't tickle yourself. And so it reduces that. I still do it with him. Um, but he helps me put on the sunscreen. He helps me do the hair washing. We also use a mirror for areas he can't see. So if he's like putting on his shoulders, he can't really see that. But also sticking his hand in something that feels like sunscreen and not knowing what's coming is not preferable to him either. So we use a mirror. Same thing with hair washing. We have a, a mirror in the bathtub for when he washes his hair. Um, and so it's just a lot of it's trial and error, but figuring out what works, what works for you guys. Uh, you can use for drinking water, you can use timing, timers, flavoring, ice, fun straws, a special cup, uh, cold water, room temperature water. Again, just figuring out what works. And hopefully I give you so many ideas that something will work. Um, when you go to the park, parks are another place that can be struggles. Uh, depending on the age, you can do a walkthrough of the park, talk about what we do and we don't do. We don't go up the slide, we go down the slide. Um, we wait our turn if there's someone on the swings or we can find something else to do. Social stories about waiting your turn as well as danger, um, stranger danger, but also unsafe. I have one who um, doesn't really understand fear and consequences. So if he is on the top of the playground, and he wants to get down, he very well may just jump. So we use those social stories about why we don't do that. Um, and you can make social stories. So there's a lot on YouTube. And if you Google it, you can also make them really personalized. Uh, my son had trouble going to school. He loves Transformers. So one of his clinicians made him a social story about Optimus Prime going to school. Um, and it was very much tailored to him. And it meant a whole lot more <laughs> to him. Um, and then those sensory bags that you probably are already doing, but just really think about what at the park might help. Um, timers for countdowns, when it's time to leave, knowing their triggers and teaching coping skills with bullying. And if somebody is picking on you and who to tell and ask for help. Um, I think that all kids could um, definitely 
use learning that, but unfortunately, especially our kids. And then our last outside tips is teaching them to help with tick checks. Again, it's like the hair washing and the sunscreen. The more they can help with, the less it has that sensory component. Um, using wagons and strollers, if it works for you, don't worry about what other people are thinking or watching or saying. I know it's easier said than done. We use a wagon that you can push like a stroller or you can pull like a wagon. Uh, we take it everywhere. It also makes really great when we have to make those quick exits and everybody gets in and we just go. Um, and then we also keep a just in case bag. We keep one in the car. I keep one by the door. We, we have them several places, so they're easy to grab. And we have a change of clothes for everybody. Um, a towel, baby wipes. We also have bubbles everywhere, like just little bottles of bubbles, because that is the number one de-escalation thing for my son. So having those handy when we need them, they're in the car, they're in the just-in-case bag, they're in the sensory bag, they're everywhere in case of emergency. So having things like that, um, that you already do and that you already know, and just expanding it can be really helpful too. Speaking of bubbles, I don't know if anyone's used these or not, but they've got them at Huzzies in Windsor. They're called Fubbles and they're the no spill bubbles. They're absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So until they can figure out how to, to unscrew the top, so I wouldn't do that in front of your kids, you know, just fill them in private, like in the bathroom, lock the door before you fill them. Um, very cool. My son loves them. So the next piece of this is going places. So before you plan your trip, um, if you're going on a longer trip, try to take smaller day trips. Um, take note of what works and what doesn't, and it'll come handy when you're going further away. Practice safety in public places during times when you have more control. Instead of waiting for the event, create similar, similar situations to see how your child reacts. It can prepare you for the real deal. Um, we had planned on taking the kids down to Boston on the Amtrak. Um, so glad that we did a smaller train ride first because trains, something about the train, my son could not do. I don't know if it was um, being able to move around. He likes being in a car seat. I think he feels safer and more secure in the car seat. And we didn't have that. And we actually had to get off the train that we were on. And now if we were on the Amtrak, they were not gonna pull that over. So, you know, if you can try to find similar, similar smaller things you can do before taking the bigger, longer plunge. Um, another good tip, if you're going on a flight, book it with DPNA. Now I haven't personally tried this. I wish I would have on our last trip. But DPNA stands for Disabled Passenger with Intellectual or Developmental Disability Needing Assistance. Um, it kind of just gives you a little bit of leeway with boarding, uh, special priority for seating. And on some flights, which I don't know if there are still flights that even do meals. I don't know. But I guess it will do hot meals. We found that online. Um, you really got to know your person before taking a flight. Our first flight, I learned a lot just on the way down. And I made a lot of changes on the way back. Pack, pack everything that you can possibly think of. And sometimes you've just got to ignore the people around you. Um, with little kids, they're, if they're going to cry, they're going to cry. And you know, it just is too bad. For everybody there, take care of yourself and take care of your child first, you know, that's all you can do. Go to the next one. Um, packing, like I said, overpack. Keep it organized, overpack. We, I had my whole carry-on was full of stuff for my son. And out of all of those things, the thing that he wanted the most was a big bag of Hawaiian rolls. And he must have eaten 
six Hawaiian rolls on the way down. I cannot believe he didn't get a stomach ache or get sick, but that's what, that's what calmed him down was eating. Um, tablets, sensory toys are good. If your child likes to color, crayons, coloring books, anything that can hold their attention if it's going to be a long flight. Um, Passies, special cups, blankets, any of those comfort items, identification for your child. We had a situation where my son got really upset and a lady came into the bathroom and kept asking him repeatedly if I was his mother. My son's nonverbal. Um, he wouldn't have answered her. He didn't know what, I don't know if he even knew what she was saying. He was so upset. But that was scary. And I mean, looking back on it now, I could have been a little bit more prepared had I had ID. I mean, I could have just whipped out my phone and been like, here's all pictures of all the way through. But, you know, being prepared for those situations, I think, help your child when when you start to get dysregulated, they can feel that too. So being prepared for those types of things is always good. Um, another thing you can do before you go is research, call to see if there are special accommodations for individuals on the spectrum, look for events in the area that are family friendly, um, or sensory friendly. I use Facebook support groups and, uh, talk to parents of children on the spectrum to see if there are things in that area. You know, you've got to be safe. You don't always know who you're talking to on Facebook. But um, it's been a really good resource for, for me to find things to do with my kids. Now we're going into summer camps. So summer camp can be a great way for kids to stay active and involved in the summer. In the summer. Studies show that summer camps can also help with regression. Depending on your child's needs, strengths, and abilities, summer camp can be a great option. So the things you need to consider before um, deciding whether you're going to look for a camp or if it would even be a good thing, you, is your child safe around water? Does your child wander elope? How does your child communicate? How will staff be able to communicate with them? And how does your child cope with being left alone? These are all things that you can consider and kind of work you can work on those things as well before they go to camp with the social stories and um, taking them in for visits before the camp starts is always a good thing to do. Um, we, I haven't personally sent my youngest son to a camp. I don't know as if I would feel safe doing that right now, but um, if I was, I would definitely take some time off from work so I could stay at least part of the time and get him comfortable with being there left alone. So tips for choosing the best camp, start slow. Um, take some time to be there with them before leaving them. Find a camp that's geared towards your child's interests. That's a big one. If they're interested in what they are about to do, they're going to want to stay. Um, there's a lot of different camps in our state, Lego building, there's computer camps, there's hiking and learning about birds, insects and nature. If it doesn't work the first day, try again, just keep trying. Um, it can take time to build comfort in an unknown place. It takes time for anyone to build comfort. Prepare your child before the camp begins, look at photos, do a drive by, see if you can do a tour, meet some of the counselors. Maybe there's somebody that they know that might want to go. Um, and make sure the camp leaders know about your child at any risk they may take. So this link has um, some different options for camps that are in the state of Maine. And I don't know if that's just camps geared towards autism or if they're camps in general. Um, go to the next one. So daycare, which is very hard, I feel like, in the state right now. 
So finding a daycare for your child on the spectrum may seem like a daunting task. It doesn't just seem it is. Um, daycare facilities that specialize in serving children with autism are very far and few in between, and the wait lists are horrendous. There, it's just not a fun situation right now for parents who need daycare. Be proactive. Put your kids on the list as soon as you can. Call, call once a week, call twice. Do not let them forget your child's name. I am not good at being the pesky person, but when it comes to this, I've learned that I have to be. Um, and I think it just shows that you're being the best advocate for your child. So in the end, you know, even if you feel like you're being pushy, um, I think that anyone who who knows how it is right now when it comes to finding services will understand that you're just being a really good advocate for your child. Um, if you find yourself in an emergency without child care, call them. Sometimes this can bump you up on the wait list. So, you know, we don't have a lot of selection right now. Um, if we could be more selective, there's some factors that you should consider. Safety is number one. Are there a lot of steps? Are the doors locked? Um, what's the child to caregiver ratio? Does the provider understand or want to understand autism? Does the provider contract with the state if your child receives services through CDS? Are they willing to? Are they willing to have uh, providers come in and do medical model? I've looked for daycare for my son. I found one. Um, it didn't go as I had hoped. It wasn't, it just wasn't safe enough for him. And I don't think that they really quite understood my son and his needs. And that's not to say that it was a bad place. It just wasn't a good fit for him. I'm very blessed that I have somebody that can watch him while I work. I understand that that is not something that everybody has. So I really feel for parents who have to put their child into a daycare, especially when they're nonverbal or they've got any type of delays or my son Pika puts everything in his mouth, especially rocks. Um, that's tough. It's really, really tough to put them into a situation where you're not sure if they're being watched 24, well, the full time they're there. And next we, oh, and a note about calling is I have run into situations where I would call a provider and they said, oh yeah, you're in the to be scheduled line let me pull you out and schedule you right now. So it might not even be like, it's just a time thing. And when you call them, they're like, oh yeah, well, I was going to call you this week, but since you're here, let's just go and schedule it. Um, and talking to providers, I've never heard daycare providers or service providers or anybody, I've never heard somebody say, I wish parents would call less. Um, so if you feel like you're nagging them, uh, for the most part, they really do appreciate it. Uh, before we get into free time, is there any questions, comments? Nope, there's nothing right now. All right, if anybody thinks of anything, please feel free to pop it in there. Um, so free time, now what? As people caring for people with autism, we see a lot of structure and a lot of, this is what we do every day. Um, and now what do we do as school ends? Um, as we try to fill our free time. First thing to look at is playtime. Um, and these are just a couple of quotes that I really thought rung true. Uh, you can learn more about a child in one hour of play than you can in a year of conversation, especially with our demographic. Um, how they play, what they play with, communication through play. Um, and it's the things that we play with and the people who make us play that make a great, or the people who play with us, help us play, sorry, <laughs> make a great difference in our lives. Um, so when we talk about play and free time, um, our free time could look very, very different than other families' free times. And that's okay. It took me several summers to be okay with not hiking and beach going and 
farmer's market going and being okay with just slowing down, doing what we need to. Um, and so we want to rethink what play is. For some people, it is patterns and sorting. It's making those lines. It's putting the colors together. Um, play can come with some very rigid expectations. This is how we're doing it. This is what I want. Uh, ask before moving pieces. Wait for a response. If you don't get a response, don't just go through with your plan. Um, I What I do is I just wait. Uh, or I come back a few minutes later. A lot of the time, my kids will be so focused on something, they have to finish that before they can talk to me about what we're doing. I also really like parallel play with my kids, and that's gotten me to work more into their space. So I start playing next to them. And I am also, I will be very honest and transparent here, I am not a parent who gets down on the floor and plays. I, with my oldest, she became a toddler. We got out the toys. We sat on the floor. We started playing. It felt like hours. I looked at the clock. It had been three minutes. That is not my play. <laughs> so we might do a craft together or next to each other. Um, I might work on building something while they're also building something next to each other. Um, it kind of works out that my kids aren't huge make-believe people because I just, it's just not for me. Um, and that's okay. And that's one of those things that like, it's just going to be different. Um, but don't be careful how close you get to their space. You don't want them to feel like you're encroaching. Um, and it might take days. It might take weeks. It might be minutes, uh, but it's pretty amazing when they open up. And then the other thing that I would say be careful about is what they want versus what you want for them. And best intentions I know have gone with some, buying some of the coolest toys and presenting them. And sometimes that's just not what they want and not what they had in mind. Um, you know, that spinning the wheels on those cars could be so much more interesting to them than the big giant ride on car that you get them. Um, don't take it personally when they don't play with the new toy. Sometimes it also just has to sit for a little bit. We brought stuff into the house that sits and they have to get used to having that in their space uh, before they'll even interact with it. So then looking at transitions. So transition meaning going from one thing to the next. Um, we go through multiple transitions a day. And for a lot of people, we just do it. We just go through. We don't think about all of the different factors in place. Um, but even going, I use the example of my daughter going into school a lot because for me, for a long time, I was like, oh, she's transitioning from home to school or from the car to school. And then when I stopped and I planned it out, she was going from home to the car, into the school, into the hallway, into the cafeteria, onto the playground, back to the hallway, back to the classroom, back to her desk. That's a lot of transitions when you break it down, especially for somebody who struggles. So in that case, we just eliminated them. She went from the car to the office. After the bell rang, she went to her class. So sometimes you can just eliminate them. If you can't, uh, there are some ways to work through them. The first one is going to be visual schedules. And this is just what it sounds like. It's a schedule in pictures that breaks down a task into steps. And these can be big steps, little steps. I have some examples of them. And they can be um, as personalized or as generic. Again, you know what works for your person. Um, the ones on the bottom, my daughter made because she likes to make her own. And that's just really visual, visually appealing to her. Um, it can be like your bedtime routine is pajamas, snacks, brush teeth, bed story. It could also be brushing teeth is getting toothbrush, putting toothpaste on it, brushing top teeth, brushing bottom teeth. It can be, again, as detailed or as generic. Um, my son's has actual pictures of him doing things or the actual pictures of places that we're going using the first then language. First, we're going to get dressed. Then you can use my phone. 
And you can use that for those non-preferred tasks too. First, we're going to put on shoes. Then you can play your game. Um, and then gradually that can be used more for day-to-day -day stuff and less of the non-preferred. Um, I use it a lot. First, we're going to OT, then we're going to the store just so they know what's coming. And these images, um, you can get, you can Google them. Um, Teachers Pay Teachers has a lot of free, like if you search and you check the free box, they also have some that are pretty cheap too. Um, Lesson Picks is another really affordable one. Um, like I said, you can make your own, they can make their own, whatever whatever works for you. Um, and then these can also be used for the safety visuals that we talked about. Um, again, these pictures. And they can be used for choice boards. Um, if you have a kiddo who might have trouble verbalizing something or decision making, I have one that very much gets into like decision paralysis. And so if I can give them a piece of paper that has like the top, I think we're up to six things that they wanna do while we're home. And then it's just a little easier, just a point. Um, and then if it's too much, I can cover two of them. And they make, if you Google them, they make all kinds of schedules that get super fancy where you slide things back and forth, Velcro to like move things, strips to cover and uncover things. Um, yeah, it all goes back to that, what works for you, what's gonna have them engaged and excited to do it. The next thing that we are looking at is timers. If this works for your person, there are lots and lots of options. Um, there are visual timers, digital timers, apps, sand timers. Um, we actually have all of the ones in this picture. So something to be mindful of is what sound do they make? Um, I can tell you that the one with the dinosaurs makes a beeping sound that sounds like a smoke detector when it goes off. The review of the place that I bought it did not say that. Now it does. There is a review that says that now uh, because my son loves it so much, but it has the same sound as our smoke detector. So it took a lot of time for me to be okay here. It go off all the time. Um, we like the app that has the duck on it because we can get really personalizing. Um, so with my visual sen sensory seeker, she likes to put pictures of herself and change the background and change the sound and all of that. Um, and when she likes it, she uses it more. The one with the unicorn, again, it's really loud. It's like that loud old school uh, school bell. So if that startles somebody, you know, being mindful of things like that. Um, and also if you can pause them or not. Some of these you can pause, some of them you can't. And if that's something that you need or add time to it, I know with the app, you can add time to it um, if that's an option you need as well. So speaking of options, another way to kind of sidestep that power struggle of we're going now, we're not doing this now, yes, no, et cetera, is to give options. So some things that might work for my kiddo is, do you want to hop like a bunny or walk like a robot to the car? So we're going to the car, but how we're getting there is up to him. Um, do you want peas or carrots with dinner? We're having a vegetable with dinner even if you might not eat it, it's gonna be on the table. Do you want it to be peas or carrots? Um, do you wanna put the toy away in five minutes or seven minutes? Again, if there's time, you can do these things. Um, how does the superhero get to the car? Can you show me what it looks like for a superhero to go to the car? Would they run really fast or would they fly? And uh, getting buckled, are you strapping into a race car or a jet plane? Lately, we've been driving a transformer. So kind of says interests and what works for you. Um, whatever your child or your person is interested in, any of these are adaptable for that. Um, so before we move on to the next thing, are there any questions, comments? There was one cat, it was about, um... Are there any tips about transitioning from school to a camp or a daycare? Because that is a little different. So I don't know if you guys had any tips around that. Yeah. So um, transitioning from school in general, uh, if it's not too late, reach out to the people they're with at school, teachers, providers, what works, what doesn't work, um, what does your schedule look like? And you can kind of 
try to adjust it towards yours so that you can follow that same routine, that same pattern. And I would say the same thing as you go from school to camp is see where you can carry over those familiar things. The more things that are kind of in the same order, more familiar, kind of the easier it will be. Um, and that communication piece, talking to camp so that you know what's going to be different. And you can say, you know, this is how you eat lunch at school. This is how you'll eat lunch at camp. This is, you know, lunch is both places, but how we're going to eat or where we're going to eat is going to be different. I hope that helped. So lastly, we're going to get into electronics. And before we do, I just want to say that every family is different. And again, please do what works for your family. Um, if you're a big electronic family and that works for you, great. If you very much limit them or don't have them at all and that works for you, also great. Um, we are not here to tell you how much or how little electronics um, you should be using or could be using. It's a very personal decision. So take what works for you. I will not be offended if you don't listen to what doesn't. <laughs> so dealing with electronics. Um, the first thing we're gonna look at is scheduling time. Those schedules carry over in every part. Uh, at our house, a lot of the time we have quiet time from like this time to that time. And that's when my older two get to use their electronics as they know from this time to that time. And so all day, you know, can we watch this or can we play this game during that quiet time is when we're gonna do it. When is it appropriate? So in our family, bedtime is not an appropriate time to use electronics. Um, eating is not an, a not an appropriate time to use electronics. And by electronics, I'll also point out, I mean like recreational electronics. I also have one with a communication device. I mean, technically that is electronics. However, that's not limited, that he gets access to that all the time. Um, so I kind of, that's kind of a different kind of electronic that we're talking about. Um, so with these recreational electronics, giving countdowns and timers um, can be really helpful. And also with those timers, some of them have like visual colors that changes or using a timer on the electronic. We do that a lot too. Um, in some families, it's a privilege that can be taken away uh, and that you know, reminding them that this is, we've earned this, but we can also lose it. In some families, I do get it that you need it for at least five minutes a day so you can take a shower. So it might not be feasible to take it away altogether. Um, and it might depend on the age and what electronics it is. And this is all, like I said, very family dependent. Uh, talking about what's real and what isn't. So for some people and some kids, it's hard to see that difference. Even if it's obvious to us, it might not be obvious to them. So just um, with the realistic things, but also with the things that don't seem so realistic um, and talking about what's real, what isn't. Um, and then of course, internet safety, which could be a whole thing on its own, but we just need to be really, really aware of that safety piece. So when you're looking at your summer, it's okay to do things different. It's okay to do what you need to do for your family. It's okay to skip things and leave places and to take it slow. And don't forget to include those um, supports and those therapy providers. Uh, my daughter has been, this is her second summer, learning to ride a bike. And until you have somebody who's really in it, you sometimes don't realize all the things that go into a certain activity like bike riding, because it is the steering, it is the balance, it is pedaling and steering and balance and looking at where you're going and concentrating and not getting distracted all at once. And when you think about it, that's a lot of things to do. So for the second summer now, we're taking the bike to OT. And her OT is working on it with her. And she actually just wrote it for the first time yesterday. And she's so excited and so proud of herself. Um, but using those supports, and it doesn't hurt to ask, like, hey, we're struggling with swimming. Do you have any ideas? Even if they can't help, they can't take you to the pool, they might be able to work on some breathing, some water safety, 
um, working on those muscles. And so if you don't do all the things, that's totally fine. If you do all the things and you enjoy it, that's fine too. Um, do what works for you. So questions. We've got about two minutes left, I think, if we have questions, comments. Somebody didn't really have a question, but they said that the guided access is an amazing tool on the iPad. So just a suggestion for somebody. Yeah, so guided access on an iPad will lock out everything except the app that you're on. Yeah. Um, we had that when we had a loaner for my son's communication device that it locked out everything but his communication. Yeah. And then I I just wanted to give a, one more piece of advice that um, we utilized when my son was younger. But when you're going someplace new and you really don't know what is around you, you talked about water safety, you talked about lakes and ponds. Remember to pull up Google and type in the address you're going to and look at the Google map. The Google map is going to show you the railroads. They're going to show you where the main roads are. They're going to show you where the pools are. And if you do a street look, you will see the neighbor's pool because it also picks up all the pools in the area. So it's going to give you a good idea of what is in that area. If you've never been before and people are like, I don't know what's around here. So just remember that there's a lot of things out there that you can get good resources from. And that seems to be everybody has the Google. They're always looking at Google. So that's a good idea. So this was wonderful. I don't see any other questions. Do you guys have any final messages uh, before we end? Have a good summer. Yeah. Have it's fun. okay to take it slow. I know I keep saying that, but it took me a long time to be okay with it. And last summer we didn't do a lot. The summer before we did do a lot, just because we did a lot one summer doesn't mean that we're up to it the next summer. Yeah. Yeah. It's and don't feel guilty about things. You know, families go into a lot of things and they're saying, oh, you're not going to go there. You're not taking them there. And don't, don't let that pressure you know, make you do something that then you're going to be like, I don't, I wish I would have never done that. Go at your pace. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. I think that's it. Ladies, thank you again. It was very uh, useful information for a lot of families. We are going to post it on our website so other people will be able to watch it when they have time on their hands because we know we're busy parents. So. <laughs> And if there's any like follow up um, questions or comments, Kathy, can you tell them yep. how to reach out? Yeah, we will. We'll make sure that they know how to get there. So, so thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks.